Good afternoon. We are here today to announce three important cases unsealed today in the Eastern District of New York. These cases expose attempts by the government of the People's Republic of China to suppress dissenting voices within the United States that demonstrate how the PRC seeks to stalk, intimidate, and silence those who oppose them. In discussing these cases, I want to be very clear that the department remains focused on the threats and actions of the PRC government and its agents, not the Chinese people or people of Chinese descent, who are often the victims of these crimes. While separate matters, these cases are all very much related. One shows an insidious strategy to collect information on dissidents in order to target them, and in some cases to imprison pro-democracy advocates abroad. One case describes a conspiracy to derail the congressional candidacy of an American citizen and military veteran who also was a former student protester at the 1989 protest in Tiananmen Square and later escaped to the United States. And one shows a campaign to surveil and harass an artist engaged in free and peaceful expression. All three of these cases show that if you report such abuse, U.S. law enforcement will respond and demonstrate that law enforcement was able to disrupt these plots and bring perpetrators to justice. Last month, when I announced the National Security Division's new strategy for countering nation state threats, I said that our approach would be driven by the gravest threats, including the alarming rise in transnational repression. This is an example of what I meant. Authoritarian states around the world feel emboldened to reach beyond their borders, to intimidate or exact reprisals against individuals who dare to speak out against oppression and corruption. For example, the Department of Justice has recently brought cases against individuals involved in Belarus's forced diversion of a commercial flight to arrest and detain a Belarusian journalist and dissident. We've pursued those who participated in Iranian plots, targeting dissidents living here, including one conspiracy to kidnap an American Iranian activist in New York. We've prosecuted agents of Russia and Egypt for illegally surveilling and targeting dissidents of those authoritarian regimes, and we've exposed attempts by the PRC and Saudi Arabia to de deploy agents inside technology companies to obtain private information on critics and in to impede the exercise of free speech. Today, we add three more cases to this list. For the Justice Department, defending American institutions and values against these threats is a national security imperative. Transnational repression is part of the range of tactics that our adversaries employ to try to undermine our democracy, our economy, and our institutions. And it is a threat not only to the people in the United States, but also to people around the world who seek to exercise their basic rights to freedom of expression and to stand up to authoritarianism. This activity is antithetical to fundamental American values. We will not tolerate such a repression here uh, when it violates our laws. We will defend the rights of Americans and those who come to live and work and study in the United States. We will not allow any foreign government to deny them the freedom of speech or the protection of our laws or to threaten their safety or the safety of their families. Today's cases, which United States Attorney Breon Peace will talk about more in a, min in a minute, demonstrate that the Department of Justice will protect American democracy and ensure that all those within our borders have access to equal justice under the rule of law and enjoy the protection of the U.S. Constitution. As I said, these alleged plots are separate cases and each will be prosecuted based on the facts and the law in federal courtrooms. And each of these defendants is presumed innocent unless they are proved guilty in a court of law. Authoritarian regimes seek to deprive people of their human rights and fundamental freedoms. These cases reflect the United States' commitment to ensuring that freedom and justice prevail. Now I will turn it over to the United States Attorney Peace, who will lay out today's charges. Thank you. Good afternoon. Today, I'm announcing the unsealing in the Eastern District of New York of three criminal complaints against the perpetrators of transnational repression schemes targeting members of the Chinese diaspora community in the New York metropolitan area and elsewhere in the United States. 
all of these victims were targeted because of their pro-democracy views, because they chose to exercise their freedom of speech here in the United States. In two of the cases, agents from the People's Republic of China's Ministry of State Security, also known as the MSS, directed the action targeting victims on U.S. soil. The MSS is the PRC's Civilian Intelligence and Secret Police Agency, ostensibly responsible for counterintelligence and political security. As these cases show, the MSS has been targeting pro-democracy activists living in the United States with harassment and smear campaigns, spying on them to help the PRC government target them for arrest, and even planning to physically harm an activist, a veteran of the U.S. military, to stop him from running for U.S. Congress. In the third case, the defendants took directives from the PRC government to publicly discredit PRC nationals who are pro-democracy activists living in the United States. As part of their smear campaign, the defendants tried to bribe what they thought would be an IRS official to obtain a victim's federal tax returns and plotted to destroy a work of art made by one of the activists who is a sculptor. Through their illegal conduct, the defendants and their co-conspirators imported the PRC government's repressive policies onto U.S. soil. Members of the Chinese diaspora community both in New York City and around the rest of the country must be free to express themselves on politically sensitive issues without fear of reprisal from the PRC government. Our office will not permit efforts by the defendants and co-conspirators to erode the civil rights of U.S. residents on account of their Chinese ethnicity and their beliefs. Now, the defendants in the complaints unsealed today include, one, an individual working for the MSS who tried to stop a candidate from being elected to the U.S. Congress, including by discussing a physical attack on the candidate who was a U.S. military veteran. Two, the head of a pro-democracy group who gathered intelligence and betrayed members of his own organization and the Chinese diaspora community in New York City while acting under the direction of four MSS agents. And three, two residents in Long Island who have been working under the direct direction of an executive with a PRC technology company to target pro-democracy PRC nationals residing in the United States. The defendants face a variety of charges, including conspiring to act as agents of the PRC government, to commit interstate harassment, and to bribe a public official. So I want to give some acknowledgments before I get into more detail about the defendants and the charges. I want to give a special thanks to FBI agents Ryan Campbell, Michael Carmack, Garrett Ego, Jason Moritz, Edward Tam, Kevin Minton, and Joshua Ray Willis. I also want to acknowledge my team in the Eastern District of New York, Assistant United States Attorneys Alexander Solomon, David Kessler, Artie McConnell, Emily Dean, and Brian Morris, and our paralegal Benjamin Richmond. And I'd also like to acknowledge Scott Claffey from the National Security Division, who has been closely working and collaborating with our lawyers in the Eastern District of New York. So let me talk about each case and the defendants uh, in those cases. The first case, the defendant Chi Ming Lin is a citizen and resident of the PRC. He is alleged to work on behalf of the MSS. In September 2021, Lin hired a private investigator in New York to disrupt the campaign of an Eastern District of New York resident currently running for U.S. Congress, an individual identified in the complaint as the victim. The victim was a student leader of the pro-democracy demonstrations in Tiananmen Square in 1989, who later escaped to the United States, served in the United States military, and became a naturalized U.S. citizen. In September 2021, the victim, who was then living in Long Island, New York, announced his intention to run for a U.S. congressional seat in Long Island in the November 2022 general election. In hiring the private investigator, Lynn explained that he and the individuals for whom he was working did not want the victim to be elected to Congress. 
Lynn said that he would pay whatever the investigator wanted as long as the investigator could disrupt the victim's campaign. Lynn first asked the investigator to provide information about the victim, including the victim's address and phone number, which the investigator provided. Lynn also requested that the investigator unearth derogatory information about the victim, or if no such information could be found, that the investigator manufacture such evidence, including by creating a scandal involving a prostitute. Then, in December 2021, Lynn proposed that the investigator also consider physically attacking the victim to, present, to prevent his candidacy. And as alleged in the complaint, Lynn stated, quote, but in the end, violence would be fine too, huh? Beat him, beat him until he can't run for election, end quote. Lynn also said that, quote, a car accident, end quote, would make the victim, quote, completely wrecked, end quote. And as recently as yesterday, Lynn was in touch with the investigator and stated that approval had not been given yet on the payment terms for a plan to involve the victim in a scandal and noted as part of the reason for the delay, quote, because the Communist Party, as you know, so many things, end quote, and added that, quote, it's not just one person who can call the shots, end quote. Lynn is charged with conspiracy to commit interstate harassment, contrary to 18 U.S.C. Section 1028, as well as conspiracy and attempt to use a means of identification in connection with the interstate harassment conspiracy, contrary to 18 U.S.C. Section 2261A. The misuse of a means of identification charge carries a maximum sentence of 15 years, while the interstate harassment conspiracy charge carries a maximum sentence of five years. The second case, Xu Jun Wang. Wang is a well-known academic and author who helped start a pro-democracy organization in Queens, New York, that opposes the current communist regime in China. However, as alleged, since at least 2015, Wang abused his position and status within the Chinese diaspora community in New York City and elsewhere to collect information about prominent activists, dissidents, and human rights leaders, passing that information to the MSS. Wang operated under the direction and control of four MSS officers. At the MSS's direction, Wang has gathered information on people and groups that the PRC considers subversive, such as Hong Kong democracy protesters, advocates for Taiwanese independence, and Uyghur and Tibetan activists, both in the United States and abroad. While posing as a like-minded individual, Wang met with pro-democracy activists to spy on them, to gather non-public information about them, such as their current political views, planned public appearances, and travel plans. And during a border inspection, Wang was found in possession of a long list containing the telephone numbers and other contact information for pro-democracy activists and advocates so that he could better track them for the MSS. Wang provided the information he had gathered to the MSS using encrypted messaging applications and emails, as well as during face-to-face -face meetings in the PRC. At least one Hong Kong democracy act activist about whom Wang reported to the MSS was later jailed by Hong Kong authorities on political charges. Wang initially lied to law enforcement, falsely denying that he had contacts with PRC officials or the MSS, when in fact he had been secretly reporting on U.S. residents to the MSS. But Wang later admitted to federal law enforcement officers that he was working with MSS officers. Wang is charged with acting as an agent of the PRC government under 18 U.S.C. Section 951, criminal use of means of identification under 18 U.S.C. Section 1028, and false statements under 18 U.S.C. Section 1001. 
The foreign agent charge carries a penalty of up to 10 years imprisonment, while the other two charges carry penalties of up to five years imprisonment. The third and final case, Fan Frank Leo, Matthew Zaburis, and Chong Jason Schwinn. Leo is a resident of Jericho, Long Island, and was born in the PRC. He is the president of purported media entities called Congress Web TV Station and the World Harmony Foundation. According to open source information, Leo has held multiple positions with international organizations and programs and campaigns in which he has interacted with high-level PRC government officials. Zaburis is a bodyguard and former correctional officer for the state of Florida. He recently re relocated from Wakala, Florida to Oyster Bay, Long Island. Schwen is a PRC-based employee of an international te technology company headquartered in the PRC. Schwen is an intermediary between the PRC government and Leo. The defendants engaged in a transnational repression operation to spread negative publicity about anti-Chinese Communist Party activists residing in the United States by harassing them and attempting to publicly discredit them. The criminal complaint focuses on these defendants' harassment of three pro-democracy activists living in the United States. Leo and Zaburis acted under Schwen's directives. They believed that Schwen was receiving directives from the PRC government. The harassment scheme included a plan to destroy the artwork of one of the dissidents, an artist who made a sculpture depicting PRC President Xi Jinping as a coronavirus particle. That artwork was later demolished in the spring of 2021, and no one has been charged in that act of vandalism. The harassment scheme also included Leo's payment to a private investigator based on Long Island to bribe what they thought would be an IRS official to get the federal tax returns of one of the dissidents. The defendants plan to publicly disseminate information about any potential tax liabilities of the dissident to publicly discredit him. The scheme also involved plans to spy on the dissidents. In one instance, Zaburis pretended to be an art dealer in order to meet with the dissident artist whose sculpture was later destroyed. While meeting with the dissident, Zaburis surreptitiously installed surveillance cameras and GPS devices around the dissident's workplace and on his car. And while in the PRC, Schwen accessed live feeds from the surveillance cameras and the GPS devices. The defendants made similar plans to electronically surveil the other two dissidents. And while using the cover of Leo's media organization, the defendants planned to interview the dissidents in mock media sessions. And Schwen provided outlines for these fake media interviews and designed questions to elicit answers that were intended to humiliate or publicly discredit the dissidents. The defendants intended that video or audio clips of these statements could be used in PRC propaganda materials targeting the dissidents. Leo and Zaburis are charged with conspiring to act as agents of the PRC government in violation of 18 U.S.C. sections 371 and 951. All three defendants are charged with conspiring to commit interstate harassment in violation of 18 U.S.C. sections 371 and 2261A and criminal use of a means of identification in violation of 18 U.S.C. section 1028. And Lou, Leo, sorry, and Schwinn are charged with conspiring to bribe an IRS employee in violation of 18 U.S.C. sections 371 and 201. Except for the section 1028 charge, which carries a penalty of up to 15 years, all these charges carry a maximum penalty of up to five years imprisonment. Now I'll turn it over to Assistant Director Kohler. So good afternoon. The mission of intelligence and security services in democratic nations is to lawfully collect information in furtherance of national security. 
The same is not true in authoritarian countries, where their primary focus is on protecting the regime. In those countries, intelligence agencies engage in disinformation, intimidate and imprison dissidents, limit free speech, and even engage in targeted killings. When governments in Russia, China, Iran, and elsewhere export that behavior overseas, they violate the fundamental sovereignty of the United States. And today's indictments, <clears throat> sorry, today's complaints serve notice to all foreign intelligence agencies, especially the Chinese Ministry of State Security, that efforts at repression within our borders will not be tolerated. You've already heard about the allegations on the five charged individuals. Let me wrap up by highlighting the counterintelligence work of the FBI. While many of our efforts to protect the American people take place behind the scenes, we will not hesitate to utilize any and all criminal or administrative tools to counter efforts that undermine our democracy or influence our electoral process. And that is exactly what foreign intelligence and security services do when they engage in criminal conduct to preserve their own regime. Whether it is disinformation from a Russian intelligence service, efforts to silence a U.S.-based journalist by the intelligence arm of the government of Iran, or harassment by the government of China's Ministry of State Security, the FBI will protect the freedoms of everyone within our borders. As Director Ray said at his Reagan Library speech in January, these efforts are really just the tip of the iceberg. For decades, the Chinese Communist Party has targeted, harassed, and threatened U.S.-based Tibetans, Uyghurs, Falun Gong members, and pro-democracy activists. And now, as if that weren't offensive enough, the government of China has targeted the campaign of a candidate for Congress. This is clear evidence of their efforts to undermine our electoral process. But the Chinese Communist Party is not the only entity engaged in these practices, but their level of aggressiveness is unique. Most importantly, their victims are often Chinese Americans the population most vulnerable to persecution for their thoughts and beliefs. I'll close by urging anyone being targeted by foreign governments or their proxies to come forward to the FBI. We have dozens of transnational repression cases. However, we believe we should have hundreds. We need affected individuals to come forward and report information to the FBI through their local field office or FBI.gov website. This is so important that we've created a specific transnational repression page on our website with more information. It includes a threat and intimidation response guide translated into 28 languages. And I have copies of that guide here to share with you. I believe we have it in English, Chinese, and Uyghur. I would also note the use of private investigators in many of these cases. I would urge all private investigators who have been asked to gather information on dissidents or have been approached by foreign governments to immediately report such requests to the FBI. And finally, I encourage local law enforcement agencies around the country who are frequently the first call for people feeling harassed or threatened to contact the FBI when they suspect the perpetrators are agents or acting on behalf of a foreign government. So unlike the Chinese, Russian, or Iranian intelligence services whose only loyalty is to the regime, the FBI is committed to upholding the Constitution and protecting all American people. Thanks for being here today. All right, we'll take some questions at this point. Mr. Olson, you said at the beginning there's been an alarming rise in the number of these cases. What's behind that rise? Why all of a sudden? Why now? Well, I think you've seen from the cases that I mentioned that the, the number of cases has increased uh, over the past several years of transnational repression. Um, what I think we've seen is that authoritarian regimes uh, have determined that um, they can seek to extend their efforts beyond their borders uh, into the United States uh, to harass or intimidate, threaten, silence their critics. Uh, so it's the, in some ways I would say it's what we've seen in terms of the overall rise in authoritarianism around the world that is in part responsible for the number of cases that we're seeing inside the United States. And that's why we take this threat so seriously. Hi, Mr. Olson. Two very quick questions. One, I just wanted to confirm that the individual who was accused in the plot to derail the congressional candidacy, he is not currently in custody. He's one of the five who is not in custody. Is that right? Let me ask uh, Mr. Peace to address that. That is correct. The other thing I 
appreciate this is this is part of a broader effort to target um, dissidents and pro-democracy uh, activists. But this notion of election interference and interfering in, in American politics, is that part of the PRC <coughs> playbook writ large, or is this a case of first impression, whereas you're you know, looking at your holdings and about Chinese cases. Have you seen anything similar to this before? So I'm not sure that we have brought a case involving uh, interference with uh, an electoral process involving the PRC government. Um, certainly the record would speak for itself. I'm not, re I don't recollect one at this point. It's certainly of a piece with the broader effort to interfere with uh, the effort of dissidents in the United States to uh, have some degree of prominence and have their voices heard. Uh, Mr. Olson, um, since you've announced your new strategy on going after uh, transnational threats and, and kind of you know changing the China initiative, um, have you seen any changes in tactics uh, that China or any other countries are using, significant changes in kind of the tactics that they're using, whether it's hiding what they're doing or being more aggressive in other areas? And then just to clarify, are any of these cases related to Operation Fox Hunt? Then I have one follow-up question. Let me ask... Uh Mr. Kohler, on that second question, uh, th I think these cases are not related to yeah. Operation Fox Hunt. Correct. No. Um, you know, in, with your first question, as you know, last month I announced that we were ending the China Initiative. I, I made it very clear at the time that we were going to uh, make sure that we were going after all nation-state threats. We had seen, a, we have seen a rise in uh, nation, hostile nation-state activity, certainly from China, but also from Russia. Iran, North Korea, and our strategy needed to meet that threat. Um, at this point, uh, certainly these cases reflect our determination to take on that threat from China, uh, but it's not China alone that presents a transnational repression threat. As I've mentioned, we have cases involving uh, Iran, Egypt, uh, uh, Belarus. So uh, whether or not I've seen a change, I think your particular question, I'm not sure that I've seen a change in activity at this point. It's been a short period of time, but certainly we're going to keep a close eye on the threat and continue to align our resources and efforts uh, to meet that threat. And just a quick follow up. There was a Senate hearing today in which the FBI testified that they have concerns about Afghan refugees who came into the country without proper vetting. Um, do you share those concerns? Uh, what are the concerns at this point, and do you know how many? Afghan refugees of concern are in the country, and do you know where they are? I can't speak to the hearing that you mentioned, having not seen it or, or heard it. Uh, I would say that we are very uh, serious about any potential risk that we face from individuals entering the country, including those who have uh, been evacuated out of Afghanistan. Um, going back to Fox Hunt, there was a case involving Fox Hunt a couple years ago. Maybe this is for uh, Assistant Director Kohler. Um, after that case, did you see the Chinese government change its fox hunt efforts at all? Like, was there a shift in tactics? Did that case have any impact? So, I, obviously, I can't speak about any particular case and, and the, the facts of those cases. Um, all I can say, I think, is that we will continue to look carefully at the types of tactics that we're seeing. I think, as Assistant Director Kohler said, we are seeing a high degree of aggressiveness particularly from the PRC, as these cases reflect, in terms of their efforts to threaten and, and silence uh, dissident voices inside the United States. Not looking for a specific number, but wondering, do you have a, an idea how many more MSS agents are in America right now, currently active? And do you draw a distinction between MSS agents and a spy? So I'm not going to comment on the first question. I, I think that for us, what we look for are violations of the criminal law. For the purposes of the Department of Justice and, and the National Security Division, we are looking to find, identify individuals who are violating the U.S. criminal code and to bring cases based on the facts in those cases. Uh, do you consider an MSS agent a spy? It depends on the particular facts of the case, sir. You, we would look at any individual case based on the specific facts to determine whether or not they violate any of the criminal laws. What about these cases? I'm not going to comment on that in, in regard to these cases. Alex? On the uh, case of the New York congressional candidate, uh, the indictment, or so the, the criminal complaint talks about how um, this agent you know, talked about maybe approaching him with prostitutes, um, other kind of ways that they could dig up dirt on this candidate. 
Was the candidate ever informed during the course of this investigation um, about, you know, potentially people trying to dig up these, you know, basically plotting against him? And was there a need to inform this person? I'm going to refer that question to Mr. Peace, if I can. Sure. Um, I'm not going to comment on specific conversations with any victims, but I will say generally uh, the department and our office takes our victim notice obligations um, very seriously, as we did in this case. And in particular in this case, you'll note also that there was discussion of a potential physical attack uh, on the victim. And of course, our office and the FBI were not going to let that happen. Ellen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you, Mr. Uh, Wilson, address whether the um, private investigators were at all um, helpful in bringing these, these cases to your attention? Maybe this is for Mr. Peace or uh, A.D. Kohler. And then I have a separate question uh, regarding another nation state and transnational cooperation. Uh, Mr. Peace on that quest first question. So as you'll see, as alleged in the complaint there, uh, the private investigators in certain of the cases did work with us on those cases and brought information forward. Is that how, is that how you became aware of? I can't comment further. Uh, I'm sorry. I can't comment further on the investigation. And, and then my second question is uh, about another uh, nation state that has reportedly been uh, active in uh, targeting U.S. persons, uh, U.S. soil, and White House has actually spoken out about it. It's, it's Iran. Have, have you or A.D. Kohler, um, can you say anything about whether you've noticed any heightened threat from this go government, this Iranian government, uh, threat, threat activity going back, say, to around mm. the November, December time frame? You know, I can, what I can say is that, is, as I think you're aware, we did charge four Iranian intelligence agents um, back in July of last year for conspiring to kidnap a U.S. journalist and a human rights activist who was speaking out against Ar Iran's repressive regime. Um, we're very mindful of the potential for additional activity from the Iranian regime, but beyond that, I can't comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.